Okay, I brought her from my home studio to the shop. She needs to have a flat back. As you can see, her back's gonna be flat. So she's essentially a kind of a three-quarter sculpt. So we will do that now. I will mark out the board. Put on there. Mark it out. Now I know how much to cut off. I think it needs to be about this high. Eh, something like that. Eh, that'll work. All right. Let's go cut it. When I decided to make the back flat on the sculpture, uh, it turned out that a piece of the armature was sticking out of the back. I didn't plan for a flat back when I built the armature. That's the kind of shit that happens to you when you just, you know, make things on the fly. So now I'm going to have to take this big ass belt sander and I'm going to grind off the armature on the back. Well, let's see what happens. It's, I hope that the, uh, I hope that the belt sander doesn't pick the sculpture up and fling her across the studio but because that would be a disaster because I put a lot of work into this and that would piss me off. All right, let's see what happens. Well, that was sketchy as hell. Yeah, I can't recommend you take a belt sander to a finished clay sculpt. Now I got a nice mix of sawdust and uh, all kind of all kind of crap on the back. All right, I glued a strip of wood onto the backer, and it's in the clamps, and when that dries, this is just a, a bracket that'll screw it to the base. That's all that is. So we'll let that dry, then we'll slap a coat of sealant on this backer, and then we will mount the girl to her backing board. All right, so let's melt some beeswax here. Makes, uh, beeswax is one of my favorite materials on the planet Earth because of the undeniable genius of bees. They make one of the most durable and most useful and most versatile materials known to mankind with their own little stomachs or however the hell they do it. I have no idea how bees makes beeswax. No clue whatsoever. I think I would know that by now in my life. you think that I would have acquired that knowledge, but no. So now I gotta heat the brush up without cooking it. It's real easy to cook the brush. And all I want to do is get enough wax melted to put a coat of wax on our, uh, on our backdrop for our girl, and away we go. Beeswax <coughs> is one of the all-time best materials for what I'm doing. Because beeswax sticks to everything, and nothing sticks to beeswax. It's like the perfect partying agent. All right, time to put the backing board onto the sculpture. Simple enough to do, it's just a matter of drilling some holes and driving in some screws. But the trickiest part of doing this is actually drilling the hole in the back of the head because I can't really push against the clay. It's too soft and I can I'll really damage the sculpture. I gotta be super careful. Nice, got the backing on there. Now I still am gonna have to do some clay work around the, the back edge. No worries, we'll get her done. Time to put a silicone rubber mold on this sculpture, but it's not going to be a poured mold. It's going to be a brushed on blanket mold. I'm gonna build a dam that's gonna retain the rubber and uh, keep it from flowing all over the place. And so off we go. I'm basically gonna build it out of little bricks of clay. It's the same oil clay that I used to do the sculpting. And uh, I think, uh, Rather than have you sit and watch me spend the next 45 minutes doing this, fitting these blocks, we'll go into hyper warpo speed mode here and uh, <laughs> get it done quickly. So again, the whole point to this is just to build a dam to, to, to create the base, of, or actually really the back of the mold where it joins the, uh, the backer board. Okay, so now I've got it all pretty much put together. And uh, that's going to work out just fine. I'm going to go through here and just seal up any joints and cracks. So I'm, I'm certain that the uh, rubber can't flow out of the bottom of the base of the mold. Okay, so we're ready to go. This is the same silicone rubber I use to make the poured molds. It's the same mix of 10 parts rubber, one part hardener that I use to make normal 
normal poured molds, but in this case, uh, it's, we're going to make a blanket around this girl. And the first coat's the most important coat. This is the coat that captures all of the detail and uh, all of the surface of the original model. So I'm pouring it over it. The reason I don't just brush it on with a, with a paintbrush is that I have found that by drizzling it like this, I can see that I'm coating every single part of the model. Sometimes if you brush on the rubber with a paintbrush, you can create air bubbles or air gaps between the rubber and the, and the clay model without realizing it. You just don't notice it until you take the mold apart and then you find you got wicked bubbles. This is the method that works best for me. It's the next day. I let the drip coat that I applied yesterday cure overnight. Now I'm going to mix the second coat, except that I'm not going to de-air this rubber because there isn't any need to de-air it in a blanket mold. The way I turn the rubber from a liquid pourable rubber into a brushable, a thicker brushable rubber is by adding this uh, very fine plastic powder. It's a polyethylene mini fiber and uh, it's very light and very fluffy and I don't really want it uh, flying around the room. I don't want it going up my nose or coating my, <laughs> coating my eyeballs or coating everything else. So I very gently fold the powder into the rubber. Notice that I mixed the rubber and the hardener together thoroughly first. You have to mix those two components first before you put any additives in or it just, just won't work. Uh, it, it won't, you won't get a, a, a good mix. So I'm going to put in just enough polyethylene to uh, make brushable rubber that basically stays in place. You want a rubber that is not so stiff that you can't work with it, but that stays where you put it. So we'll get this mixed up and then we'll apply it. You can see the rubber uh, is very thick, but you also can see that it flows a little. It slumps a little, and that's uh, just about the right working consistency I want for this second coat. The blanket will be built in multiple coats, and each coat has its own kind of different requirement, as you will see as we go along in this process. The most important thing now is what it always is in mold making, not catching bubbles but as you apply the rubber to the surface of the model. The first coat is the coat that captures all of the important details of the surface and essentially gives you that bubble-free casting, but, you, but it's really very, very thin. So you want this second coat to also be uh, very carefully bubble-free, but also to begin to build the thickness of the blanket. When building a blanket mold, the idea is to make it as thin as possible, yet stiff, thick enough and stiff enough to retain its shape. You don't want it flopping around as you uh, rotocast it. So it's this balancing act between a very, very thick, stiff, heavy mold and a very thin, flexible mold uh, that doesn't hold its shape. It's it just ex experience and having done a bunch of them, kind of you get a feel for how much and, and how thick you need the mold to be and how many coats it takes, and you work up your own methods. But I find uh, that probably, f I think this mold will be five or six coats of rubber of various thicknesses and various uh, consistencies. But this second coat is almost as important as the first coat in capturing the fidelity of the model because you, I'm being very, working very slowly here. I mean, here you're seeing me working at five times speed, but I'm working very carefully to make sure that I'm not trapping air against that first coat of rubber. I'm trying to break out any bubbles I find and hoping that I'm seeing it all clearly and making sure that I'm not catching any. You know, it, I keep harping on bubbles, but really any flaw in the mold is more work down the line any flaw in the mold means filling, patching, sanding, cleaning, re-sculpting, uh, huge pain. And the, the craftsmanship and effort that you put into making the mold just pays enormous dividends down the line when you get really clean, perfect castings out of the mold every time. It's particularly true if you're making a, an addition run of something. 
like I don't really know how many castings of this girl I'm going to make, maybe only a couple. This is more of a demonstration mold than it is a production mold. But in a situation where you're going to make a production mold, say you're going to make 100 castings or 50 castings of the same thing, if you have a flaw in the mold, you're going to have to fix that flaw 50 times. It gets really old really fast. It also gets very unprofitable and uh, very expensive if you're doing this you know, to try to make some money because you don't want to be fixing or patching or sanding or cleaning uh, a flaw in the mold 50 times because that flaw in the mold translates into a flaw in the casting. It's just crucial when you make molds that you, that you learn and maintain your craftsmanship so that the mold is perfect and what comes out of the mold is perfect or as close to it as you can get. If you work carefully here, you will save a tremendous amount of time down the line. If you'll notice, I mixed this third coat much thicker and heavier than the first two. So this is the layer where I'm really going to try to build up the main thickness of the mold, the sort of main bulk of the mold, and also try to fill in areas where there are going to be, you know, really big undercuts that would tend to make it harder to pull the casting out of the mold. That's what coat three is designed to do. Coat number four is designed to keep building up the thickness of the mold, but also it's designed to begin smoothing out the surface of the mold. After the rubber blanket is completed, we're going to build a mother mold. And that's just a hard shell that goes around the rubber to hold it in place during the roto molding process. It basically just supports the rubber blanket mold so that it can't wobble or deform or move around during the roto casting process. If, if there's too many surface irregularities in the rubber blanket, it makes it very hard to get it out of the rigid shell of the mother mold. And to help with that effort, coat number five is the thickest coat of all. It's really almost a spackle, and it stays and lays perfectly where I put it. And here I'm going to go around and fill all of the irregularities in the surface of the mold. So I just go around uh, get, only getting rubber on the tip of one finger to make the cleanup easy. By the way, I clean up with just with paint thinner yeah, and that works fine. So uh, I'm, getting, uh, I'm, I'm getting the absolute least amount of materials I can on my fingers. You might ask me why I'm not wearing a latex glove at this point or some kind of glove. And I just find that a glove, it just makes it so hard to feel and to rub the material onto the surface. So I let the silicone get on my fingertip for a few minutes, and then I carefully clean my hands. I don't really like to wear gloves when I work in the workshop, mostly because if I get materials on my hands, I can't tell I've got it on there. And uh, then uh, I get it all over everything in the shop. So... I just, instead of wearing gloves, I just am meticulously clean most of the time. And if I do get materials on my hand, I immediately uh, clean my hands, get it off of there. The last coat smoothed out all the big bumps, but left a rough surface. Coat number six will give the mold its final surface. I have let the mold cure for 24 hours, and now it's time to make the mother mold. I start by spraying the blanket with a parting agent. It can sometimes be really difficult to get the mother mold to separate from the rubber blanket uh, the first time when you first, you first pry it off. And having a parting agent on the rubber makes the whole process a lot easier. I work my way around the mold, hitting it from all angles, and give it a light but thorough coating. When I've got it coated to my satisfaction, I'm ready to make the mother mold. This is the urethane resin I'm using to make the mother mold. It's a two-part system, just like casting resin, but the big difference here is that as you stir this stuff, it gets thicker and thicker. I mean, you can see that it's changing from a runny liquid into a rather thick paste which is perfect for this application, uh, laying it up or uh, painting it on a surface uh, to build up a thick shell. Uh, I already have done most of the first coat, 
I managed to do that off camera. It's amazing how much better a video camera is at making videos when you turn it on. Anyway, <laughs> oh well, it was a worthy try. But uh, yeah, it doesn't really matter because I still have plenty to goober on. And the truth of the matter is this isn't much more complicated than frosting a cake. So it's just a matter of going around and building up as even and as a, a consistent a coat or a shell around the uh, rubber blanket as you can get. Again, it's all of uh, this, this tug between putting a lot of material on and making a really super strong shell or putting the absolute minimum amount you can, you can use um, and making a lightweight shell that doesn't use a lot of materials but is still strong enough to support the rubber during the casting process because that's the job. The, the mother mold does nothing except kind of hold the rubber uh, blanket mold in place while the mold system is spinning on the roto casting machine. And just as a point of interest, you see how much lighter the resin is when it's first mixed. It's it's just exactly like casting resin. So here you, it looks like I've got you know two different mixes going on, but in fact I mix them identically, and you will see the subsequent layers of resin will darken to match the earlier ones. It's something you see all the time while working with urethane resins, is that there's a substantial color change between the uncured resin and the cured resin. This is the final coat. I'm just trying to make it as smooth as I can. And once I get it done, I'll set it aside and let it cure for a few hours. All right, we're going for it. I'm going to take this mold apart and see if we have ourselves a good mold. I have full faith and confidence that we'll uh, get a good mold out of this thing. But you never know till you see it with your own eyeballs. So, of course, if you're watching this, it probably means we were successful at demolding it. Because I won't show it to you, probably, if we're not. <laughs> I'll just tell you, it failed. Let's see here. Let's see here. Let's pull this thing. Pull, try to pull the clay out. Let's see if we can pull the whole thing off the backer. That would be a good way to start. If we can get the whole thing yep, come off the backer. There we go. Nice. Now that came away clean. So there's the backer. Came off very nice and clean. Of course, we're going to use this as the backstop of our mold, so we're going to need it. So, now the trick is going to be to get the mold off of the sculpture. And the first way to do that would logically would be to get the... Ah, oh, it popped right off. Nice! Wow, the, the, the mother just came right off. No worries, no hurries. Easy peasy. All right, that bodes well. That bodes very well. Let's see what kind of a mole we got here. See how good we did. Some interesting little bits and pieces in there. All right, let's just see. She should pop, more or less, right off. A little bit grabby. All right. Oh, yeah. Let's get this mold off of there. Try not to cut it. I like to have it be in one piece. Very much. Oh, yeah. All right. Hello. She's out. That pretty much dinged up her lip. Get it out of there. That caught. Generally speaking, dinged her up to get her out, dinged up her ears. Well, she did her job. Her job was <clears throat> to make this mold. And it looks pretty good. Pretty darn good. 
I don't see any big bubbles. I don't see any big flaws. So nice. Very nice. Let's see if it goes back in the mud. Oh, sets right into the mother. Boy, that just could not have worked out any better. Great. Now see, there's some trim job to be done. A little bit of trimming. And we'll have ourselves a finished mold. Uh, at least the rubber and blanket part. We still have to attach it back to this. Get it in place and get it to be so that we can attach it to the backing. But it's going to fit just great and it's going to work out just fine. Excellent. We are in very good shape for making castings of this girl.